Welcome guys! Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to Miko's Corner. I hope you have a good day. Uh, today we're back with Napoleon. Napoleon Endgame! One more episode after this one and we're, we're done with the series. Uh, I will do the Marshall series, don't you guys worry, but that was a great, that was a great series. Um, I mean, the ups and downs and the mistakes and the drama and the, the cannonballs and the, the death and Davu who goes to Napoli. Great series, great series. Epic History TV did a great job with this. Uh, this was an incredible series. I learned so much, even though I've already watched the series beforehand, you know. But uh, watching it and making a reaction of it, I don't know. It just the the information sort of sticks um, more, uh, and I just the whole series was incredible, incredible. I mean, from the beginning when uh you know all the countries in the first coalition just rushed france and then napoleon came second third fourth kicked all of their asses and then yeah but now napoleon endgame france 1814 this is the end guys you know uh i don't know what he's gonna do but apparently it's pretty badass so uh yeah let's watch In October 1813, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig, yeah. the Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick and demoralised, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. But in November, the armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. The Frankfurt proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get, now that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. Even so, he did not accept the terms. No he way. He agreed to reopen negotiations. Why? Why didn't he just accept them? I mean, to, uh, France would be way bigger than it is now. Belgium would be in France, even the Netherlands, part of uh, Germany. Uh, and he would still be king. To the Allies, and many in France itself, it proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. The war went on. And by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, was now besieged. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army and made to join the coalition. French troops evacuated the Netherlands. That's, I don't understand why he didn't, I mean, I guess at that point it's like, <sighs> I'm fighting to the end, you know? Which reasserted its independence after nearly 20 years of French control. In Italy, Eugène's army faced a new enemy, Joachim Mura, king mm. of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men to honor his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. And he gets fucked at the end as well. He gets deposed. In Paris, Kill. Napoleon responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Property taxes doubled, state salaries and pensions suspended, 300,000 new conscripts called up from a country already exhausted by 20 years of war. He should have taken the peace, Amsterdam. He ordered the release of Pope Pius, under French house arrest for the last five years, to try to shore up his support in Italy. It didn't work out, huh? He even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain, a condition that Fernando was in no position to honour. But these concessions were too little, far too late. Too late. Yeah. In January, 
two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. Blücher's army of Silesia and Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. On the 25th of January, Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace, before leaving for the front. He would never see either of them again. With just 70,000 men, he faced odds of four to one. Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms, many just learning how to hold a musket. But for the first time in years, Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. The result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. No way. He's coming back? Imagine Napoleon waging war in the 20th century. His cavalry replaced by Everybody would speak French. Cannon by attack helicopters. The old I will march to meet them, then you will see the meaning of the world at the back. <laughs> Who's this Count Vigeno, man? I've been seeing his name like for the past three. The battle three. for France would be fought east of Paris, mostly across Champagne, a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine and their tributaries. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The Emperor advanced rapidly, hoping to trap and destroy part of Blücher's army. But after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. Go, 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 man! As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher, heavily reinforced by Schwarzenberg, made a surprise attack at La Rothière. La Rothière. Allied troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village defiantly held by young French conscripts. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket during the battle. By late afternoon, Vreda's Bavarian corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties. 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater, but by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Believing Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance along two routes to ease pressure on the roads. Blücher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine. But dividing their armies again would play right into Napoleon's hands. Dude, Napoleon was... No matter what people said, nobody ever said... Nobody ever disrespected him. You know, they may thought he was a foolish, prideful, arrogant, uh, overly confident, but he was never like uh, Napoleon. He's yeah, he's like fine, but he's not the greatest uh, military uh, leader of the times. Everybody was respecting After him, no matter what. After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds. The aggressive Blücher racing ahead, while the more cautious Schwarzenberg lagged behind. Leaving Oudinot and Victor to guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. 
the army of Silesia was strung out on the march, oblivious to the danger it was in. First, Napoleon fell on General Osufiev's Russian 9th Corps at Champaubert, destroying it, taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmiral. This was a much larger force, with two infantry and one cavalry corps, and was expecting support from York's Prussian 1st Corps. But the Prussians were late, and Sacken's troops could not withstand the French onslaught. At this desperate hour, the Emperor's elite Old Guard were no longer held back, but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting. Those were like the best of the By best. By the end of the day, Napoleon had inflicted another 3,500 casualties, twice his own losses, and the Allies were in rapid retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal Macdonald to cut off the enemy's escape by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. But York's Prussians got there first. The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rearguard as the enemy fled across the Marne, destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit, Napoleon doubled back to rejoin Marmont, who had been left to keep watch on Blücher. Napoleon attacked at Vauchamp, using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Blücher's army, which was soon in headlong retreat. A merciless French pursuit inflicted 6,000 Prussian and Russian casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Napoleon had taken on an enemy army almost twice his size, and beaten it four times in just six days. <laughs> Blücher had lost an Okay, so this is insane. Five days, he, he was 30,000 versus 57,000. The six days campaign fucking destroyed everybody. Five days, uh, 600 losses, casualties. Uh, uh, to 3,000. 2,000, 3,700, 500, six, the last one is the biggest. 600 to 6,000. 10 to 1 casualties. Estimated 15,000 casualties in battle, and another 15,000 in smaller engagements, as Whoa. stragglers or deserters. 10 to 1? For now, the army of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. 10 to 1. But in the south, Marshals Victor and Udino had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. Fucking Austrians, man. Turning their backs. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon raced south. Schwarzenberg, alarmed by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. Yeah, everybody, It dude. was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, routed at Mormain with 2,000 casualties. When people hear that Napoleon's coming, everybody scatters. That's, that's the most insane, because what's, in, what's insane to me, because he's gonna lose, you know, there are like 200,000 army, he has like 50,000. The odds of him winning, very low. But what's really interesting to me is that no matter where they are, the guys, you know, they're in France, it's over, right? And when they hear about him coming, they flee right away. Not only because he just destroyed a whole army, but because it's Napoleon. You know, Bernadotte, you know, his uh, previous marshal, who was, eventually become, uh, became the king of Sweden, was right. You cannot beat Napoleon one-on-one. -on -one. You can't, you have to, you know, over and over, distract him, you know, uh, all over the place. Otherwise, you cannot beat him. You just can't. Napoleon sent Victor's second corps to seize the bridge at Montereau, but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor and gave his corps to General Gérard. The next day, at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river, with 30% losses. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had at Lodi 18 years before. Jesus Christ! Napoleon had the Allies on the run. But how long 
could it last? Yeah, no, it's over. Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened at Châtillon-sur-Seine on the 5th of February. The Allied terms were now more severe, a return to France's frontiers of 1791, which meant the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. Instead, he tried to revive the Frankfurt proposals, hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, yeah. whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. Of course, he sees father-in-law. But this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Chaumont. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France, while Britain added the sweetener of a £5 million subsidy to be shared among the Allies. Mm. The treaty's secret articles specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Switzerland and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons and Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. You know what's funny? Is that whenever everybody has a common enemy, uh, everybody's friends, they're friendly, the best friends. Because Napoleon pissed off everybody, he invaded everybody, he was too strong, too powerful, and too arrogant in some ways. Uh, Everybody, you know, they're like, dude, we're all together against Napoleon, we're best of friends, 20-year alliance, man, bros, we're bros. And then, what happened? You know, the moment Napoleon's done, especially, you know, after this, and he gets exiled twice, you know, but once Napoleon, the whole Napoleon thing is over, everybody comes back to, you know what, you know, we're friends for a long time, you know, we're buddies, but no, you know, that territory is over there, I think it should be mine, you know? A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last, best hope for a favourable peace. That was gone. Mm. And news from across the country was bleak. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without a fight. Nancy, Dijon and Macon had all fallen. In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez, forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialised. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. French peasants took revenge when they could, but there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. I mean, the terrain is The chief different. desire among ordinary French people was for peace. Yeah. At almost any price. I mean, at that point, you become delusional, you know, you're like... Any talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. The French Emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him, even though it was twice his size. But Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety behind the River Obe. Smart, you know, let him... Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon so turned his attention back to Blücher. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris, 
gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal Macdonald in command in the south, Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher. And what's really mesmerizing to me is that the marshals and the people, you know, still in the army are still loyal to him. Because they see they're not morons, you know. You can you can see where the dominoes are gonna fall. It's over. But they're still loyal to the end. You know, it's very few of them like Murat, uh, not Murat, was it Davou? The the king of Naples, the bitch, uh who uh turned his coat. Uh, he was like there. There are not many cases of people throwing their coat. And, and Bernadotte, listen, whatever you want to say about him, uh, you know, maybe did he turn his coat and all that? He was the crown prince of a new country. He had different obligations now, you know. Uh, he just, I understand why he did it. Uh, when Davout turned for Naples, that was purely selfish. It was logical. I get it. You know, you can see where. You know, the things are going, he didn't even pan out. You know, the guy turns his coat and ends up getting killed at the end, so. Covering 60 miles in three days along terrible roads choked with mud. At Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, burning the bridges behind him. Everybody flees, man. The guy 24 is... hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers and Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Enne River, because the major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. But after just a day's fighting, the garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered, allowing Blücher to escape. Yeah. Napoleon continued his pursuit across the Enne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. The Russians fought stubbornly. The French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. Yeah. Napoleon pushed on to Long. But by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces. 98,000 troops in all, and outnumbered Napoleon two to one. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Napoleon was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of recklessness, was unwell and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Mm. Long was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. Undaunted, he fell back to Soissons, and after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint-Priest's Russian corps. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint-Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Meanwhile, in the south, Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon as he found out Napoleon had gone north. Yeah. In heavy fighting, he'd driven Oudinot and Macdonald back from the River Ope. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes, as Macdonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganize his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. Schwarzenberg, emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Laon, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Napoleon advanced on Arcis sur Eube, ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating as he believed, 
but gathering for battle. As heavy fighting broke out, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. Yeah. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the Army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. Mm. In desperate fighting, Napoleon personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. Jesus Christ! But the odds were too great. Yeah, three to one. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. Go back, go back. <laughs> the guy wants to die, he can die, you know. Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly, so he decided to change strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies, join up with some of his isolated garrisons, and cut the enemy's lines of communication, forcing them to abandon their advance on Paris. But the Allies, until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Talleyrand, the most brilliant French diplomat of the age, and the most slippery. He'd served France's monarchy, the Revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807 he fell out irrevocably with the Emperor over foreign policy. She's the pure of he France? now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin and worked behind the scenes to ensure his downfall. Peter Bellish, From Paris, Paris, he wrote combined. to the Russian Emperor Alexander at Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling, and the city's defences had been completely neglected. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, without allowing Napoleon to distract them. Talleyrand's information was confirmed when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, meant for the Emperor. The treasury, arsenals and powder stores are empty. We are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented, wishing peace at any price. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Then began their march on Paris. At Fer Champenoise, they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps, advancing to join Napoleon. An entire National Guard division, 5,000 men, was virtually wiped out as the marshals suffered a crushing defeat. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. His political authority and ability to wage war might not recover. Yeah. So when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans and ordered a forced march back to Paris, intending to lead its defence in person. I don't think he's gonna make it though. Napoleon's wife and son were evacuated from the capital, along with most of his ministers. His brother, Joseph, the ex-king of Spain, was in charge of the city's defences. Come but on, Joseph! Done little. Yeah, I mean, what's he gonna do? Paris was awash with rumours of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies adding their troops to the garrison. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard, but many more young conscripts, while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. Can you just imagine the smell? The Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops outside the city, and given the urgency of taking Paris before Napoleon could intervene, 
their elite guards and grenadier divisions, would lead the way. On the 30th of March, they began their assault from the north. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city, on condition the garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. At the Hôtel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Serrouillet oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, yeah, she's not giving as well them as back. Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. That's petty! You know, that's really petty, but I get it. I get it. The guy's like, yo, I'm 71. You're not giving it back, man. You know, we took him? No way. And so he's just burning everything. <laughs> Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when he was informed of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. I mean, yeah, it's over. Yeah, they're not gonna burn it, you know. On the 31st of March, 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. Parisian That's crowds cheered the... That's 300 years, no? 1453? The Hundred Years' War was 1337 to 1453. I doubt I'm mistaken, I'm pretty sure I'm right for this. So 300 years? Three <laughs> Allied <laughs> monarchs, bringers of peace. Everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. <laughs> yeah. Above all, they cheered for Emperor Alexander of Russia, now hailed as Europe's saviour. Don Cossacks bivouacked on the shop. It's interesting how, you know, things turn, you know, one day you're the greatest, then you lose, then you're the, the worst, you know. Like... Allied troops generally behaved well. Thirty-five miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau, with 36,000 men, all of them hungry and exhausted yeah. after their hundred-mile forced march. It's over. Nevertheless, Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. But for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals, including Ney, Macdonald, Oudinot and Berthier. I mean, they're right. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France. Yeah. He accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, and he must abdicate in favour of his son, if possible. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon, and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favour of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces, for himself and his heirs, the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Napoleon's abdication was formalised by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of Emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle, with more than 7,000 casualties. That's not you know. 
The night after his abdication, Napoleon tried to commit suicide, using the poison that had been made for him in Russia, in case of capture. But it had lost its potency, and he survived. The guy is unkillable, man. The guy is unkillable! The guy takes poison, survives. He's in the middle of the battle, people get blown away by cannonballs left and right, the guy survives everything, never, you know, once, but I think in the beginning, I think it was in the, after Austerlitz, was it in Prussia, in the beginning, 1807, 1806, when he got hit by like a, a, a musket, and he survived that, he, his, whole, his horse dies, he it falls, he survives that, he's fine, man. he takes poison, fine, he gets, uh, he abdicates once, he, he doesn't get killed by the others, he comes back, up, doesn't get killed, gets abdicated again somewhere in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> Two guy... weeks later, Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace, and began his journey into exile. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. Mm. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives were lost across Europe. Damn, that's a lot. Most soldiers died not in battle, but disease. from disease. That's the most brutal. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. For most of this period, Napoleon was master of Europe, imposing treaties on humbled enemies, redrawing frontiers, overthrowing old regimes, and making new kings. I mean, it's... He was the last figure in history to combine total political power with frontline military genius, in the mold yeah. of Alexander and Caesar. But it seemed like Napoleon's him. reign was to end in abject military defeat. However, exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. In less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign to reclaim his throne. This is an incredible series. Guys, I suggest you all go give a like to Epic History TV, subscribe to their channel. They're amazing. They're, this is an incredible channel. So guys, this is the this is the, the, the episode before the end. The next episode, Waterloo, that's the end. Uh, but that was an incredible series. Incredible, it's just everything was great. Everything was great. Uh, Napoleon coming in, one, two, three punch, you know, surviving and just being a badass, you know, fucking three to one odds, four to one odds. The the five day campaign he did those was incredible, you know, ten to one in terms of casualties, you know. Uh, but it, towards the end, I mean, and I'm surprised that the marshals and the people around him, generals and just people, uh, stayed loyal until the capital fell, you know. If I was this gonna be. Truthful, I would have bounced with Mura, with Davu when everything went down in Russia. I would have bounced right then. Now, granted, I don't know the guy. I don't know if I would be... See, the guy must have been, like, incredibly charismatic. Like, he would be the biggest and most powerful and celebrated actor if he was alive in the 21st century. That type of charisma, that's insane. Or a leader, he would be king or president or whatever. Because... That type of charisma is insane. It truly is. I don't know what the guy was like personally, one on one, but for people, and it's not like the guy only knew wins. You know, it's not like he won battle after battle after battle. So, you know, of course, you're going to be loyal. So someone always wins. But when he starts making decisions, there's a little bit iffy, starts losing here and there, Spain. Russia and people still stayed loyal, 
when everybody became his enemy. Spain, Germany, uh, Sweden, England, uh, Russia, Austria, even his father-in-law turned. But, you know, when that happens and people are still loyal to you, I don't know what's, what, what the hell is that? <sighs> Anyways, uh, I hope you guys like this video. Leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. See you guys.